that now. So Dr. Boyles, if you want to go ahead and um, share your screen. So are you seeing my screen? Because I thought I already had it shared. And uh, we stopped it um, before, so just um, hit that button one more time. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I don't see that. Infection associated glomerulonephritis really is a clinical pathologic correlation. It's really in need of um, correlating the clinical findings along with what we're seeing under the microscope. So before we start, I just want to say we're going to be looking at, you know, I know this is 2020. And when I say infection, you might think viral infections, but we're going to focus today on bacterial infections and the kidney. And really, I just want you to open your mind beyond what you may have learned in the past, maybe in medical school or in textbooks. Because in the past, most cases of bacterial infection associated glomerulonephritis, those occurred in children, typically following a streptococcal upper respiratory or skin infection, and those were called post-infectious glomerulonephritis. But really, there's been a huge paradigm shift. Most of the cases that we see today are actually in adult patients. And a significant percentage of cases of infection associated glomerulonephritis now target adults especially the elderly or immunocompromised. And really, these infections are ongoing at the time of active renal disease. So instead of saying post-infectious glomerulonephritis, the terms infection-associated or infection-related are much more appropriate. Because really, when you say post-infectious, you imply that there was an infection, then there's an infection-free latent period, and then there's onset of the glomerulonephritis. But in these cases, the presentation of active renal disease coincides with active infection. So it's a very important concept to keep in mind. Um, and the sites of infection in adults, much more diverse than children. We're not just talking respiratory tract and skin. We're thinking also lung, heart, bone, mucosa, deep visceral sites. So it's more diverse. Also, the infectious pathogens, there's a much broader array of microorganisms implicated here, and particularly now staph infections. So last thing, before we look at the renal biopsies, in contrast to what you've learned in children uh, where they have a favorable outcome, um, most cases of adult infection-related glomerulonephritis, um, only a minority actually recover complete renal function. A large proportion will have chronic kidney disease or even end-stage renal disease. So it's really important to look at this topic today. So let's get started. And I just want to say, we have a few cases. I'd like to go through the light, then we'll switch to immunofluorescence, and then look at the electron microscopy. Um, these are actual slides that we prepared here that we have um, from patients with infection-associated glomerulonephritis. But I will say, we're altering the clinical, the actual clinical history, just to kind of emphasize our, our points of teaching here. There's no concern for any patient confidentiality um, concerns here. So here's our normal-looking kidney. Uh, we're looking here at a PAS stain. So how do we know it's a PAS stain? Well, you know, kidney pathology, we do several different stains. We look at levels um, on PAS, which is what we're seeing now. Um, we also look at the H&E stains or hematoxylin and eosin. We'll also look at trichromes and Jones stains. So there's really four main stains that we'll look at. Um, the PAS and the H&E, those are both very pink looking stains, but the PAS does tend to really highlight the tubular basement membranes. So it almost looks like you have taken a little pink pen and you've just circled around each tubule. So that's really a great way to tell that you're looking at a PAS. Also, the glomeruli are very crisp. Um, you see prominent Bowman's capsule. You can see the glomerular basement membranes. And then the mesangial matrix will show very PAS positive. So an H&E will look pink, but you're not going to be able to see the crispness. Um, Can I ask a, 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 a kind of a crazy question here, but does it look like those tubules have like cracked 
cytoplasm? Like, why is that? Well, um, it almost looks like some like a is that just an artifact of like tissue processing, or is that something that is not? Is there is that? Am I just making something up? I mean, this is a pretty normal looking uh, like, tubular prank. Go back up a little up, bit. Go there back is up. a little bit of tubular injury in this case, and you can somehow stay in your lane, up. Matt. Stay in your lane. So kind of scroll like up a little bit. Yeah, sure. Let's look at a glomerulus. Like no, no, right here. Like see, see, kind of those lines that kind of cut through. I don't know. I'll stay in uh, my lane. No, I think you're hallucinating that. <laughs> hallucinating. Okay. Sorry. I, I see what you mean, Matt, but I, I think there um, can be a little tissue chatter sometimes. Okay. You get a little right. artifact. That's the key with renal pathology. There's a lot of noise. You have to really filter out the noise. Kind of and I think as noise. a nephrologist, I always yeah. look for the noise. And there's a lot of noise in renal pathology, so it's it's it can be challenging. Yeah. So it's just a distraction. But let's look at here at this glomerulus. This is a great, very normal looking glomerulus. Um, it's normal because you see these open capillary loops. Um, there's really nothing filling them. And this is, you know, this glomerulus is about to serve its purpose in life to filter the blood. So you want these open capillary loops. That's normal. Um, you want to see a normal amount of cellularity within the mesangium. Um, this is really a nice, I just want you to kind of look at this normal looking glomerulus before we go to our first case, just so we can provide a great contrast to what we're going to see. So I'm going to switch over to our first case. We're going to start with a PAS stain. These tubules look a little different. This is a different biopsy. So this is our first case, which is represented um, an adult male who has history of IV drug use, comes in with an abscess, and it is cultured for MRSA, so a staph infection. Patient does have acute renal failure, hematuria, you know, active urine sediment, and low complement, low C3. So what are we going to see on the renal biopsy? When you start to look around, we know we're in the cortex because we see glomeruli. And if you just kind of look a little higher power at these glomeruli, you notice these do not look the same as what I just showed because there's just, those open capillary loops are not as obvious now. These glomerular capillary loops are filled, so they're too cellular. This is what we would call endocapillary hypercellularity. Gonna Kind of look around so you can appreciate. There's also a background. The mesangial component is also more expanded compared to normal. So you can have you have a, a, a quick yeah. question here? Um, so sure. I once used the term endocapillary proliferation, and then a pathologist told me that that was not as accurate as hypercellularity. So can you speak a bit about kind of why that term is better here? Yeah, I mean, those terms are used interchangeably. Um, endocapillary proliferation you know, does mean the same thing as endocapillary hypercellularity, but the terminology, it is preferred endocapillary hypercellularity um, because the, it's not just a proliferation of the native glomerular cells that live here, such as mesangial cells and endothelial cells. You also have other cells um, coming in from the circulation, like inflammatory cells as well. So you're not really proliferating the cells that are already there. It's more of a hypercellularity composed of a combination of different types of cellularity. So endocapillary hypercellularity is more specific um, to represent this. So, you know, the PAS does serve its purpose to really look at tubules and glomerular morphology, but sometimes when you're looking, especially in cases of endocapillary hypercellularity and you're trying to determine which cells you're actually looking at, sometimes it is better to switch to an H&E stain to get a better look at the cellularity. So, if there aren't any questions on this PAS you know, stain of this endocapillary hypercellularity, we can switch over to an H&E and look at the same case. Any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. They will come directly to the, um, to the moderators and the co-hosts of the so we've switched over to an H&E stain, and this also looks pink, but notice the tubular basement membranes are not highlighted like we saw before. Also notice we can now see a red blood cell cast in the tubular lumen. When you're on the PAS stain, you will not see red blood cells because they do not highlight in red. They don't stain. Um, it's just a staining characteristic of a red blood cell on PAS. So if you're seeing red blood cells, you also know you're on an H&E. 
Um, there, was, there was a question. Um, can you can you specifically show us one of the endothelial cells um, when you're when you're moving back to the, whenever you get back yeah. to the glomerulus? It is very hard when you have a glomerulus that is so cellular to point out, you know, an individual cell. It's a lot easier with a normal looking glomerulus to point out the actual endothelial cells versus the, you know, mesangial cells. But I'll definitely try if I see, you know, def definitive. Like even here, um, when you have your capillary loops, the nuclei that are closer to the mesangium, those are going to be the endothelial cell nuclei. Um, here at the kind of top left, you can see one capillary loop of the glomerulus, and then this nucleus here, which is protruding into the capillary lumen, that's an endothelial cell. But it's a little bit hard. And really the concept is more, more than, you know, just picking out an individual cell, just looking at the concept of what are we seeing. And basically in this glomerulus, this is endocapillary hypercellularity, which is global, meaning that the entire glomerular tuft is filled with cells, not just half. This would be segmental. Um, or did less did you half. go through the uh, chocolate chip rule on this? Oh, chocolate chip rule. I love chocolate chips, but I, I haven't heard. Uh, of yeah, so chip. it's like when you look at all the nuclei in there, it should be like what the recipe calls for for a number of chocolate chips, not for what you actually want to put on there. Well, I don't know. This is like the chocolate lovers version. You got that's a chocolate lovers, and that's not that's chocolate. not what you're supposed. You're supposed to have a small number of chocolate chips. Yeah. And and that is that's way too many. That's way too much chocolate. Way too many. I agree. So that's why I wanted to start with just the look at the normal glomerulus and now look at this one. You can tell too many chocolate chips in the recipe here for sure. And, and Dr. Boyle, oh, those, uh, those red dots, those are red blood cells, correct? That is correct. We did not see that on the PAS because those red blood cells did not stain, but on the h &E, now you're also seeing the red blood cells in the mix. That's oh, I didn't I know that, that red blood cells only stain under h &E. Now you'll easily be able to distinguish PAS, h &E, there you go. Actually, the red blood cells will stain on all of our stains except PAS. So h &E, Jones, trichrome, so all look red, but PAS, they just look translucent. So another term we use, we're looking at if this process is global or segmental. Global meaning the entire glomerular tuft is involved. Um, segmental will be less than half. And also if the process is diffuse or focal. You know, if you kind of scan around looking at this case, you can just see too many chocolate chips in all the glomeruli, too much cellularity. Even in this view here, we have three or four glomeruli all showing the same. But I want to look at what types of cells these are because we're going to go beyond just saying endocapillary hypercellularity. There's another word to use here in this case because a lot of these cells are actually neutrophils. So neutrophils are one of your white blood cells. They're polymorphonuclear leukocytes, you know, along with your eosinophils and basophils. Those PMNs are termed that because the nucleus, instead of just being a single um, one, nucleus. Um, they have this segmented lobulated nucleus with anywhere from three to five little segments. And so that's how you're able to identify that these cells are neutrophils. Can you appreciate would you make any Would you make any comment on the, the capillary wall uh, here, like if it's thick or not, or are you not able to really assess that here? On H &E, there was a question in the chat. Yeah, on H&Es, it is hard to assess if the capillary loops are really thick or not. Um, on the PAS, sometimes you can get a sense of capillary loop thickening. Um, but yeah, on the H&E, it's, it's very hard to assess that. The, the, what you're really seeing is just the endocapillary hypercellularity. Um, we'll keep looking around at the capillary loops as we look at other glomeruli. Yeah, the capillary loops don't really stain. The glomerular basic membranes do not stain with H&E. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. What is going on there? This is really the same thing as the other glomerulus where you just have a global. It's just a weird cut or something? Cause that looks no. just like some Well, here's some weird, the arterial. Like some mini gloms in. are in there. Yeah, here's the arterial coming in and just, you know, some of these cells with a single nucleus are probably the same cells. up in there. But then, so the point really on this case is just to see not just the endocapillary hypercellularity, but the tremendous amount of neutrophils. And when you have the neutrophils, the term that we're gonna use here is exudative. So think about, you know, your exudates or transudates. This is inflammatory with neutrophils. So an abundance of intracapillary neutrophils, we'll, we'll call this an exudative, uh, proliferative and exudative glomerulonephritis. Would it be possible to get a, get a closer look? There was a question about if we can see a neutrophil a little bit. Yeah. Just, just looking personal. for like lobulated um, yeah. 
multinucleated. Um, yeah, so, oh, that's a nice one. So right here you have three little lobes. One, two, three. As opposed it looks to- like, It looks like it's smiling. Yeah, a little smiley, smiley face. Although this glomerulus is not happy. <laughs> also the cytoplasm is just very bland. You know, it looks neutral, hence called neutrophil, as opposed to an eosinophilic appearing cytoplasm of an eosinophil, which is also has multi low beta nuclei. Um, but these neutrophils, let me go a little higher. So there's your Scrabble word with an X, Matt, exudative. Thank you. <laughs> I'm playing tonight, so, so I needed that. <laughs> so the pattern on light microscopy is an endocapillary proliferative and exudative glomerulonephritis. And yes, I think you can see some of these capillary loops. They are a little, a little prominent looking. But this is the main pattern. Now, an abundance of intracapillary neutrophils, an exudative look. When you see this pattern, it is very concerning for infection. I mean, there are other glomerular entities that would cause a neutrophilic infiltrate, but when it's this global and diffuse, this is really highly characteristic for infection. Do you want to move on to immunofluorescence? Just, this is a, a kind of off the wall question, but why, why is it, why do they get stuck in the glomerulus? Are they in other capillary beds too? Or is this just, um, I mean, I guess you can see, um, rashes and other things in the skin. Is, it, is this uh, happening in other place, parts of the body? No, I mean, this is, we're not going to go into pathogenesis. There's so many different theories and concepts. You know, is it circulating immune complex? Is it, you know, in situ immune complex formation with activation of, you know, bringing in the inflammatory cells? Is it molecular mimicry? I mean, we're not going to get into a pathogenesis. Let's not focus on the how did they get there. Let's just focus on, we're looking at a renal biopsy and this is what we're seeing and they're there. So, we're not going to speculate because I couldn't exactly tell you for sure. Got it. But also look here how you can see Bowman's space. It's very open. Um, this glomerulus, this is why you're calling it endocapillary, meaning inside the capillaries is where the proliferation is, as opposed to an extracapillary proliferation, which would be like a crescent. Um, we don't see any sort of proliferation or extracellularity within Bowman's space. It's all contained within the glomerular tuft itself. So this is an intracapillary versus an extracapillary proliferative process. I think we should switch over to immunofluorescence because I really want you to take a look. There's a question about the, the tubules, but they, they were pretty normal, correct? Here, I'll switch back over since I haven't completely. Yeah, the tubules here, you know, with infection associated gamonophritis, it is not uncommon to see a little bit of background tubular injury. Um, like even here with this red blood cell, the tubule with the red blood cell, I mean, the cytoplasm, it is a little bit thin. Look next door, we actually have some mitotic figures. So there is some tubular injury in the background. You have reactive looking nuclei. There are two mitotic figures here. Sometimes you will have a little bit of cytoplasmic swelling. So there is often a background of some mild tubular injury, um, as well as a background of a little bit of interstitial edema. These tubules are spaced just slightly apart, maybe a little more than normal. And you see this kind of bluish background. On the H&E stain, that bluish background is representative of edema. So there is a background of some mild tubular injury, like even this tubule here. The cytoplasm is very thin. So yes, the tubules are not quite normal. That's the correct observation. And before we go to immunofluorescence, sure. um, you told us that this is highly indicative of infection associated, but can you give us a little bit more of a broader differential of this so that we're not, you know, you know what are the other possibilities it could be? Yeah. I mean, maybe you didn't, maybe the, the, path, the nephrologist didn't give you any history at all. Yeah, well, that's why you really need to look at the light along with the immunofluorescence and the electron microscopy, because it's really a combination of all the findings that will point towards infection. But on light microscopy alone, um, a proliferative lupus nephritis could have a lot of global endocapillary hypercellularity, maybe not as many neutrophils in every single glomerulus, but that's, you know, one example of something else that could look global endocapillary proliferative. But yeah, we really need to look at the immunofluorescence as well um, and the EM. It's really everything, and that's also why it comes down to the clinical context. Um, this patient has an active infection. They have low complement. 
let's switch over and take a look. We had this debate on Twitter about whether or not a pathologist can bias themselves from the clinical history. Absolutely, um, yeah. And uh, what do you think about that? That is definitely possible. Um, you have to really keep an open mind. Um, really, you can't anchor on your first inclination of what do you think the diagnosis is going to be? Or when you read the history, you might think, well, this sounds like it's going to be one entity. You have to really keep an open mind and look at everything and know there's a lot of overlap between many entities. So it can be challenging and you can get biased. So you have to really keep an open mind and work with your clinician and really discover the best, um, the best interpretation. All right, can we see? Let's turn it up. I'm looking under the microscope and I see the glomeruli, but I have to. So make this sure. is a live view of fluorescence. Yeah, I have it on immunofluorescence. I'm trying to get it bright enough to show you. Oh wow, this is cool. We're seeing it a little bit. It, it kind of came and went. Okay, well that's here. Let me adjust the okay, light. There we so go. This is matching more what I'm seeing under the microscope. So you can see I'm moving it around a little bit. Yeah. So this is, is that so a, cool? Is that a glom right there? That's. That's right. Up? So. You're kind of seeing a silhouette of a renal biopsy core, but the is that, that mesangial in appearance? Or? Yeah. So then, when you see this really bright staining, wow! I'm look further and see. Here, I'm going to adjust the brightness for you because now that we're a little bit higher, it's looking a little bright. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, we never really get to see this because we usually just see the uh, captured image. So this is very yeah. nice to see it coming yeah. through live. It's really pretty, and it does kind of burn out a little bit fast sometimes, so it's hard to get a live look, but we're looking today at this fresh case, and we have granular staining within the glomerular mesangial areas, and then you can see some of the capillary loops. There are some deposits along the loops as well. I can kind of scroll around so you can appreciate that this is occurring in the majority of glomeruli, so this is the IgG. So look how the, here we have two glomeruli kind of side by side, and I know they don't look as pretty in shape as what we saw on the light microscopy. Um, you know, there is a little bit of frozen artifact to some extent, um, but you can still identify that we're looking at a glomerulus. You can see the mesangial regions and the capillary loops. You can see the silhouettes. And you say this is IgG? Yes, this is IgG. And that first one, this is all the, all, so far all you showed us is this I, That's IgG right. stain. Okay. We're just scanning around on the IgG looking at what we have. So, and so um, normally you wouldn't see much staining at all here. How do you know when you're staining um, immunofluorescence that it's truly a negative or a fault or it's like the stain's not working? Well, you have way? a little bit of an autofluorescence, um, like even the tubules, we can kind of see the silhouette. Yeah, I can see um, that. If it doesn't work at all, also you have protein resorption droplets in the background and casts, those will stain. If you had complete black you know, if you had no autofluorescence at all, then you would know there was no stain applied. So Got you should it. see a little bit of a silhouette. Okay. And then it becomes obvious when it's positive because it's so bright and powerful. I mean, this is a three plus intensity. We, we grade the intensity um, from zero to three based on how bright and how abundant um, the deposits are. In this case, it's very bright. So we would say three plus, top of the scale. So let's switch and look the same case at the C3. So in this case, the immunoglobulins we look at, in every case actually, we look at IgG, IgA, and IgM for immunoglobulins. In this case, the IgG was three plus positive. The IgA and the IgM were both negative. Here is the C3. This is the complement component C3, and it's also very brightly positive. Same pattern, granular, mesangial, and capillary loop. So a couple questions. Um, is it possible to distinguish uh, the mesangium between the loops? So it, it can be a little bit hard in this case because you have a prominence of both. It just kind of looks like, you know, everything is staining. That's, that's how it is. I mean, you have to kind of look at, when you have a mesangial only pattern, it will become more obvious because you'll see the empty capillary loops. And I do have a case like that to show you today. Um, it, it, you have to kind of just take a look. And I can show you for a contrast in a later case today, a mesangial only look. I can also show you in contrast if you'd like. I just have one 
section set apart. So as, as a while, non while, while you're switching, um, is this the, sorry, Matt, um, is this the starry sky pattern? There was a question about that. Yeah. So when you have a mesangial and capillary loop pattern, that is starry sky. Now, this is a, this is a different case. Don't get confused. I switched. This is an IgG of a membranous case. And this shows you the capillary loop pattern. Now, that's what I was going to say is like, if, if you, and I think the distinction here is how prominent is the mesangium in the staining? And if you have great uh, ribbon like structures, then you've got, uh, the, then it's not, it's not as prominently mesangial. And that's what this is. It's, it's, uh, I think when it's all loop, it's easier to see. When it's exactly. all mesangial, it's easier to see. But when we were looking at both, it becomes a little difficult to tell where you are. Um, so that's probably why it was hard to tell, but you can see, I think more easily in this other case, what a pattern would look like a global granular capillary loop pattern, such as a membranous. This is a PLA to our positive membranous case that I just, I wanted to show you in contrast. I thought someone might ask. <laughs> so we'll switch back to our case. Um, the C3 we were looking at, and yes, this would be a starry sky pattern with loop and mesangial. So the whole sky has stars. So in this case, I didn't show you the kappa and lambda, but it would mimic the IgG. Um, it would go along with the polyclonal IgG staining. And then the C3 also very bright. So we've really seen the light microscopy on this case. We've seen the immunofluorescence. And now let's look at the EM. Here's our first case. And here's an electron microscopic look at our case. And it's really busy, isn't it? It's just so hard to tell what's going on at first. Um, because remember, those glomeruli on light microscopy, they were really filled with extra cells. So when you look by electron microscopy, similarly, there's a lot of cells here. But if you just really start by trying to orient where are the glomerular basement membranes in this image, that is the first step. So if you look at this top half of the image, you can see this glomerular, this gray glomerular basement membrane kind of out pouching here at the top. This is a capillary loop. And then you also have glomerular basement membranes kind of overlying the mesangium. When you look at the bottom half of the image, you just see a lot of cells, um, but you don't have a surrounding glomerular basement membrane. So we're in the mesangium down here at the bottom. And a lot of these cells are mesangial cells. So it's a lot to look at, but if you just try to first start by saying where is the capillary loops at, you can start to orient yourself. Then with the capillary loops, you know you have podocytes um, on the outside. So you start to look. And on the outside here, you can see we have some podocytes surrounding this glomerular tuft. And you know it's a podocyte because you see these little microvillus kind of branching cytoplasmic extensions of the podocyte. So when you're looking for deposits in a glomerulus, if you start with where is the glomerular basement membrane, you can look, are there any deposits above or below? Do we have any sub-epithelial or sub-endothelial deposits? So the epithelial would be the podocyte, right? So be below the podocyte is where you're looking for your sub, meaning below, epithelial, I'm sorry, um, sub-epithelial deposits. So we have these very dark structures along the edge of the capillary loop. Those are your sub-epithelial electron-dense deposits. I think it would be easier actually to switch to a higher power look of just one loop instead of so much of the glomerular tuft at one time, just so it's a little bit easier to orient. Um, again, just starting with where's the glomerular basement membrane in this image. All right, so we see this glomerular basement membrane. We see the podocytes out here on the edge. So this is Bowman space. We see the little microvillus transformations coming off the cytoplasm of the podocyte. So sub-epithelial electron dense deposits are right here. Dark gray structures. Do you see those? Yeah, they look nice. And then when you're looking on the inner aspect, it's sometimes easy to tell you're within the capillary loop because you'll see red blood cells, which don't look red under the electron microscope, they look very dark and black. So these are red blood cells here in the capillary loop lumen. And then your endothelium, uh, this would be an endothelial cell kind of protruding into the capillary loop. You really don't notice often the endothelial aspect because it's usually very thin and fenestrated. Um, 
any little deposit though that's going to occur between the glomerularis membrane and the endothelial aspect, these are your subendothelial electron dust deposits. So infection um, associated glomerulonephritis, they really like to have these large subepithelial deposits. Um, we're going to see some better looking subepithelial deposits on one of our additional cases, but oh, wow, Looks like these are pretty big. So every so every like they're spaced out perfectly. Yeah, this is really why you can tell on the immunofluorescence why you saw the granularity along the capillary loops because the deposits are occurring out here along the capillary loops. Um, the mesangial deposits were harder to see because there was a lot of cellularity in the glomerulus on that first image. We saw them there, but I think it's really easier sometimes to get a sense of these deposits sometimes by immunofluorescence, but then also the electron microscope will confirm their presence. There's a question about, can you, can you point out the, the podocytes? Yeah. So in this low power view where we have a little bit more of the glomerular tuft in view, here would be a podocyte. Here's the podocyte nucleus, here's the cytoplasm. And then you really can't see the foot processes because they're effaced, completely overlying the capillary loops. But then in the Bowman space is where you're seeing all these little projections of podocyte cytoplasm. It's easier to see here. Here's the podocyte cell cytoplasm, and here are the little microvillus projections coming off around. And um, are these, are the presence of the deposits, does that give you any indication whether this is early or late in the process? That's true. Sometimes a little later in the process, you'll have a little bit of resorption and remodeling occasionally. Um, but, but with this immunofluorescence being this bright, and most of these deposits are very dark, um, you really can't rely on that feature alone. So basically, just looking at our picture, this was our case as a whole. We looked through the whole case. The light, we had a proliferative and exudative glomerulonephritis. We had immune complex deposition. We had abundant electron dense deposits. And this might seem on first glance like this looks just like our classical childhood post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Um, it does, however, the clinical context is why this is different. This was an adult with a staph infection ongoing at the time of the active glomerulonephritis. Um, so if we were to use the word post-infection, we might miss an opportunity to actually look for the infection if it wasn't clinically apparent at the time of the active renal disease. Sometimes you have to really go back and look for the infection source. So it becomes, a, it's a more inclusive term to say infection related or infection associated, implying this could still really be an ongoing infection. Any questions on this first case? I think we're, we're good. Awesome. Ready to keep moving. Let's do it. Thanks, that was awesome. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, we're gonna switch back to our light microscopy. We're gonna start there. Make sure we can see. All right, we're gonna start with a second case here. And this second case is gonna be represented by an adult female with diabetes who comes in with a foot ulcer and cellulitis. I'm gonna switch our camera, make sure we can see. And she has an MSSA infection. She does have acute renal failure with active urine sediment, and in this case, nephrotic range proteinuria. So we see some pink here. Do we know if this is an H and E or a PAS? H and E. Yep, you got it. This is an H and E. Look at the red blood cells. So these glomeruli look similar, mm -hmm. right? Too many chocolate chips again. So we again are looking at a proliferative glomerulonephritis, which is exudative because you see all these neutrophils. But there's a difference in this case. I don't know if you can pick up on this on the H&E. The mesangium is really expanded in these glomeruli, more, more so than the other case. Sometimes it's easier to look at the mesangium on the PAS. So let's switch to 
switch over to the PAS stain of the same case, the diabetic with the foot ulcer. And now I think we can start to appreciate the difference. The background mesangial matrix expansion has a nodular quality to it. And that's because this patient is a diabetic with underlying nodular diabetic glomerulosclerosis. So when you have a pre-existing renal disease and then you get a superimposed infection associated process, um, that can lead to what we're seeing here on this case, where you have kind of two things colliding in one glomerulus, the background nodular glomerulosclerosis and then the superimposed proliferative and exudative glomerulonephritis. Any questions on this glomerular morphology? No, I think uh, any questions again, please continue to use the chat to either me, Matt, or Clarissa. Oh, We're looking man. at an artery here. We can see some background intimal fibrosis. That seems like a big artery. Yeah, it's an interlobular. Um, these are the normal sized arteries you'll get within the cortex. There is a lot of intimal fibrosis. They'll get a little bit bigger when you're sampling an arcuate sized artery. <laughs> Is that a, uh, oh wow, that's a little circular lesion there. Yeah, you can see why it's called nodular glomerulosclerosis. Mm -hmm. Here's a great look. I just think this is a beautiful example of a diabetic with a typical you know, foot ulcer, cellulitis, and then comes in with this. And again, it's a diffuse global process, meaning all these glomeruli, really, if you've seen one, you've seen them all. Um, they all have this look. But let's look at the, Let's look at the immunofluorescence on this. There are some, con it looked similar by light minus the pre-existing underlying renal disease. But on the immunofluorescence, there's gonna be a little bit of a difference here. Sorry, but, but before you switch, um, those tubular basement membranes are a bit thick, right? That's right. Um, the tubular basement membranes are pretty prominent with a diabetic nephropathy. Um, we are at the PAS, so it's easy to see, but you're right. That's a great observation. Um, these tubular basement membranes, they are pretty prominent, and that does occur with diabetic nephropathy. Yep, good pickup. Okay. So, switching over your immunofluorescence. Our last case looks similar on the light microscopy. So maybe the immunofluorescence will be similar as well. So we'll the ID. Okay. okay, here we are. We're in business now. The tissue. We're having some issues, we're having some issues with, the issues with the sound. All right. Oh, so back. this is the IgG. You see a background staining, but this um, you can see the glomerular morphology. IgG on the same case IR, but there's no real fluorescence occurring here. This is a negative IgG. You can see the nodular mesangial ex expansion pattern, but you don't see any bright immunofluorescence staining. Um, remember how you were commenting that the tubular basement membranes they look prominent, and they you know in diabetes this also happens by immunofluorescence where you just have this kind of accentuation of the glomeruli and the tubular basement membranes on the IgG, and that's just a normal look. But in this case, the, the IgG is actually completely negative. So while it looks similar on the light microscopy, the immunofluorescence was really different. So let's look at our other immunoglobulins that we stain for. This is the IgA. Mm. Look how bright that is. Definitely not subtle. Yeah, this one is not subtle. This is three plus. 
and also mesangial. Very mesangial. This is the one that where I said you can really more easily tell that the mesangium was the, the area of the glomerulus that was staining. You can see these loops on the it's outside. It's almost like you can see like the autofluorescence of the loops. Yeah, it's really pretty. In the background. Here's Do y'all do anything to try to diminish autofluorescence at all with, with the stain? No, I mean, because it's not, a, it, it, it again goes back to signal to noise. We know that's their normal background look and you just learn to interpret the signal. So here's a great look of the mesangial nodules with all the mesangial deposits, the IgA, and then the capillary loops that are seen free of deposits on the IgA. I'm gonna to go to the C3. I know we're running low on time, so I wanna make sure to at least get through this case. So we're gonna go until uh, 12.10 today since we started a bit late, so. Okay, great. And okay. you know, we, we just want you to keep going. Okay, uh, I'm happy to. So here's the C3, I switched. Looks the same though, where we can see the background nodular mesangial expansion. In this case, you do have granular mesangial staining, but also more staining along the loops for the C3. Um, some of these loops are starting to show some deposits. And here's another look, and then we're gonna look at the EM. There's some really beautiful electron microscopic images to show. So, you know, we've looked at the proliferative and exudative look, but by immunofluorescence with this IgA 3 plus staining, I mean, the question is, you know, why is this not just IgA nephropathy superimposed on diabetes? I mean, that is actually the most common, you know, glomerular disease to be superimposed on diabetes is IgA nephropathy. So that's why it goes back to the clinical pathologic context. You know, this isn't a young male with mild proteinuria, normal complement. This is an adult patient with a known active staph infection. Um, you know, they have an exudative proliferative look on light microscopy that points towards infection. They have low complement. So it kind of goes back to putting together the constellation of all the findings together to really um, come up with the right diagnosis. Um, and whenever you have IgA staining, within the glomeruli, you know, it can be three plus like this, but it also can be traced. That is a known association with staph infections um, that they often will have IgA dominant immune deposits. So you refer to those as IgA dominant infection associated glomeruloniditis. Now on the electron microscope, this is another great feature of infection. We have this large subepithelial hump like deposit in view. So we just start by saying, okay, where's the capillary loop? Here's the glomerular basement membrane of the capillary loop. Um, we have our little podocytes out here, our foot processes. So here's the inner aspect. We have our little fenestrated endothelium on the inner aspect of the capillary loop. But right here, right next to the capillary loop and adjacent to the mesangium, we have a large subepithelial deposit. This is a hump-shaped deposit. You can have hump-shaped deposits in other entities, but when you see this, you do highly think about infection as a possibility. So those other ones, you wouldn't call them humps in the other they, case? Those were sub Mini humps? Those were kind of smaller sub deposits. So a hump is like a mountain. The hump is, this is more of a hump. I mean, those were large sub deposits. Well, I just put on Twitter, I, I called them humps. This is a hump here. I mean, no this doubt. Is a, so that's a, that a baby hump. This one's pretty big. No, the other one. Yeah, the other ones are kind of baby humps. This is Got it, hump. okay. And then look at the mesangium, this gray material here on the right hand side, this is a high power look at the mesangium of this case. And we see all these dark deposits throughout. So we have mesangial deposits and then we have large subepithelial deposits. Let's look at one more image of this case. Look at this, three in one. When the deposits, when these large subepithelial hump like deposits occur right here at the, where the mesangium and the capillary loops kind of branch off from one another, this is the hinge region. And with infection, the subepithelial hump like deposits, they love to nestle down in these little hinge regions. So a hinge hump. Hinge hump, yep. Got it. Got it. So this is really characteristic of infection. And really just the whole constellation, the, the proliferative and exudative with the immune deposits, um, hump like deposits. You can see a really great contrast here from our first case in that you know, the immunoglobulin might be IgG, it might be IgA. Um, it can vary. So again, that's why there's really no specific one pattern that fits with infection. I do have one more case I could probably um, 
show that really briefly if you'd like because this would be a really great contrast to show another case that looks different. Okay. So our third case we're going to show all right, this is our third case. So there's a question a um, here, Ed. Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, so the question was that how would you see just for a regular nodule or diabetic glomerular sclerosis, would you see anything on EM like deposits? No, you should, with just a diabetic nephropathy uh, with an immunofluorescent study that is negative, there should not be any electron microscopic deposits by EM. Um, I didn't really point out well, but that electron microscopic view also showed thickened glomerular basement membranes. So the changes on EM for diabetes without an infection would be thickened glomerular basement membranes and mesangial expansion, but without deposits. So the electron microscopy should correlate with what you saw by immunofluorescence. They go together. They both are detecting deposits. So here's our third case of an elderly gentleman with obesity and hypertension, comes in with community-acquired pneumonia. So just starting with the PAS on this third case, you can see these glomeruli are pretty enlarged. That's probably because of his history of obesity. But look at the capillary loops, how they're so open. We can finally see, kind of back to our very first image of the normal glomerulus, we're again seeing these normal open capillary loops. The endocapillary proliferative exudative look we do not see that in this case. But this still is too cellular because the mesangial areas are expanded. And there are two oh, it's almost like the mesangial areas are highlighting those capillary loops, like yeah, making it more prominent. You don't are, ever see it that prominent. These capillary loops are pretty prominent. And when you're on the PAS, which highlights the glomerular basement membrane, now you can start to say these capillary loops, these glomerular basement membranes, they look more prominent. And the tubular basement membranes are also prominent. Yeah, sometimes that does occur. You're going to understand why these loops are so prominent when we see the electron microscope. Uh, there's a, so keep there's us in suspense. On. Yeah, so just because the light doesn't look like much is going on along the loop, sometimes there still is by immunofluorescence and EM. But yeah, the mesangium is too expanded. Um, but you don't see any uh, binucleated cells in there, right? Binucleated. Okay, so yeah, you don't see like uh, neutrophils yeah, like in there. That's right. All, all those cells yeah. have single nuclei. That's right. All the cells here are single nuclei. Um, now that we have a case without endocapillary proliferation, we can see the endothelial cells better. They're more easy to identify sticking into these lumens. Mm -hmm. um, like yeah. here's an endothelial cell. But then the, the nuclei that are surrounded completely by matrix, those are the yep. angial nuclei. And then the nuclei that are outside the loops, these are just the sites. Oh, cool. It's but easier to see without keep proliferation. That, keep that right there. Sure. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So this is the look. We have a mesangial proliferative look. And I didn't say this patient was a diabetic. I mean, this could be a diabetic with non-nodular mesangial expansion. That's possible. But in this case, that is not what's going on. I'm going to switch immunofluorescence so we can look at the punchline here. Okay. In this case, we had immunoglobulin. So here's the IgG. And again, we see the background kind of autofluorescence. We can see the mesangial expansion, but we don't have any actual fluorescence. So this is a negative IgG. Well, maybe it's like our second case where we had an IgA dominant case. But actually the IgA is also completely negative in this case. The IgM was negative. But when you get to the C3, you can see from a mile away these glomeruli because they're so intensely brightly positive with very strong C3. And this is probably your better representation of your starry sky look. It's just easier to see, I think, on this case. The glomeruli are a little enlarged, so I think it's easier to see. 
you have the granular mesangial and granular capillary loop pattern. But it's not like that membranous case that I showed where every single loop had a deposit. You can still make out a few glomerular basement membranes that do not show deposits. So it's not really a membranous pattern, but it is a starry sky, granular, mesangial, and capillary loop pattern. Isn't that lovely? So now this is a great contrast between our other cases. You know, C3, when it's very brightly positive, you've seen that trend through all these cases. That is very characteristic of infection to have strong C3 staining. Um, you might or might not have an associated immunoglobulin component. You could have IgA or IgG or just C3 alone. And in that case, this case here, uh, we're just seeing complement only. So this is just expanding the spectrum even further morphologically with what you'll see with infection-associated glomerulonephritis. Any questions on this immunofluorescence before we look at the EM? There's a question, why is it called C3 dense disease? Okay, so there is an entity uh, of C3 glomerulopathy where you have dense deposit disease, um, but that is not what we're looking at here. Um, C3 deposition is just a descriptive term to say we have glomerular C3 staining, C3 deposition, but this is not a deposition disease. That's a completely other entity. Um, there's a few common words there that are used, but this is not uh, to be confused with a C3 glomerulopathy, meaning a complement abnormality, um, because of the clinical context in this case of an active infection. And so for a C3, C3 glomerulopathy, you would have more kind of C3 dominance compared to IgG, correct? That's right. I mean, in th this case, just by immunofluorescence alone, you can say, why is this not C3 glomerulonephritis, C3GN? Um, because in C3GN and sometimes in infection, you will only see C3 staining without immunoglobulin. Um, our first two cases could not have been a C3 glomerulopathy because they had immunoglobulin. But, you know, a C3GN typically will have more of a membranoprolific pattern on light microscopy with double contour formation along the capillary loops. We did not have that pattern. Um, you know, the hump-like deposits, like I said, those are characteristic of infection. You can still see those in C3GN. So then it goes back to the clinical. Do they have persistent hypocomplementemia for weeks and months? Do they have active, you know, urine sediment for months? Um, these, this is going to be more typical of a course of a, a long-standing um, glomerular process rather than a transient infection-related process. And then sometimes you can't tell the difference and you have to revert to actually testing um, doing genetic testing and looking for an actual abnormality of the complement pathway. So it can be very hard to distinguish sometimes. Um, that is true. Yeah. So here's our electron microscopic look at this third case. Um, you can see just kind of starting out that we are seeing a few open capillary loops, just like we saw in light microscopy where the loops were open. We don't have the cellularity plugging all these capillary lumens. Um, but remember we saw how thick those loops looked? Well, we have a lot of deposits actually coming all the way around these capillary loops when you look at higher power. Can you go to the presentation mode on that? Oh yeah, so sorry about that. There you go. So here is our high power look at a loop where you have, you, know, you look for the glomerular basement membranes, you find the podocytes, and on the other side, the subendothelial aspect, we have a lot of deposits here along the subendothelial aspect of the glomerular basement membranes. So that's why those loops look so thick, and that's also why on immunofluorescence you saw staining along the loops as well, because that was subendothelial electron dense deposits. So this is just really a completes the full spectrum where we've seen mesangial, subepithelial, and now subendothelial deposits as well. Um, really, Excellent. there could be any location. Yeah. Uh, there's a question, do you see double contours here? There's not a great new glomerular basement membrane. You have expanded, you know, subendothelial space, but we don't have a crisp, clean, new glomerular basement membrane in this, in this picture. But that's something you typically uh, see in a scenario like this. You should, you, you, you will see that. Um, well, if you had more double contours, I think more of like a C3 glomerulopathy mm -hmm. would have that, C3GN. Um, in this case, you have a lot of subendothelial deposits. Some of these, sometimes you'll start to see next to the mesangial region that look 
but along the peripheral area of the capillary loops, we do not have double contour formation. So here's our mesangial area, looking high power. Remember we had so much mesangial matrix to look at? Well, under the electron microscope, we could see these deposits throughout the mesangial region. And they just look darker than the surrounding matrix. So I just, I really wanted to show this case because it just kind of completed the morphologic spectrum where we had an endocapillary proliferative and exudative gomelonephritis. Now we have a mesangial proliferative gomelonephritis, all of them with really strong C3 staining, but some with or without, you know, immunoglobulin component. The EM we can have a various, you know, location of deposits. So that's why it really goes back to the full constellation of clinical findings, knowing the patient, knowing who's at risk. Um, you know, that diabetic with peripheral neuropathy, um, you know, advanced renal disease cor corresponded to advanced end organ um, disease with peripheral neuropathy and then greater risk for ulcers and bacterial infections. So it just kind of comes back to um, having a high index of suspicion and really knowing the patient and putting it all together. Would you be able to repeat the clinical history for this last case? Uh, there's a few questions about that. Yeah, so this would be representative of an elderly gentleman in his 70s with hypertension and obesity, comes in with community-acquired pneumonia. This was a strep pneumo infection, low complement, heavy proteinuria. That's the typical scenario for this. There's, so, a, a, there's yeah. a question about, since you have these endo, um, the, the, uh, the lesions are, tip, are, are what you described, uh, or, why don't you see wire loops on the light microscopy? Yeah, sometimes they're more subtle. Um, you can sometimes see wire loops when the subendothelial deposits are very exuberant. You don't always pick up on that, just kind of scanning around and looking at one slide. Because you see um, it in lupus with subendothelial yeah, deposits. Yeah, in lupus, these deposits are much larger and confluent. Even in that bottom right-hand image there, we have small little granular deposits all together. So it's just the magnitude is not as much in this yeah, sort of lesion. In lupus, this entire area would all be a confluent electron-dense deposit. So you would have more of an abundant look on the light microscopy. So it's almost like a spectrum of endocapillary. There's definitely a spectrum. And this is like on, on the lower end of the spectrum of amount of deposits. And lupus yeah. is on the higher end. These deposits, even on the top right loop of this bottom picture, they're very small. They're going to highlight very intensely by immunofluorescence, but on the light microscope, you're not going to really notice those. So okay. sometimes I you guess to me, it's like the same size as the GBM, so it seems big, but I guess I don't see, I don't look at a lot of EM, so. Well, it, we looked around, some of the loops were very thick, and it's just, you know, you're looking at one little loop of the whole mm -hmm. granular tuft. Sometimes you'll have some variability. Even on the PAS, some of these loops look more normal, and some look more prominent. They looked prominent because of the deposits, but it's just not that wire loop look. Okay, thank you. And there were there were no subepithelial humps in this last case, correct? There was a question about that. There were not. We just had mesangial and subendothelial. Subendothelial. So the humps are very helpful when they're there, but they won't always be there. And just because you do not have a hump doesn't mean it's not infection. You won't so always for the find them. So for the first case, we had baby humps. Second case, we had big humps. This case, none subendothelial, but no endocap, no wire loops. That's right. All right. I think I, I think I've, I think I, I might be able to remember this for like a day or two. Well, it's a spectrum. That's why I wanted to next month, if we could do this again and continue the topic of infection associated gomelonephritis and specifically deviate more towards endocarditis associated gomelonephritis. And in that type of infection, we're going to expand the spectrum even further. Um, more patterns by light microscopy, more patterns by immunofluorescence. So uh, maybe we should have done this session on Wednesday. What's Wednesday? Yeah, what's oh, okay. Wednesday? That was a joke. Okay. Can you share the joke? It's hump day. Oh wait, hump day. Oh, <laughs> oh man. All right. Um, so oh. it's a nice way to wrap up this session. And that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Boyle. Um, Boyle's I'm going to share a poll with the group if you can um, give us some feedback on this session. Um, if you have any, any comments, suggestions, ways you think we can make these sessions better, feel free to reach out to uh, Matt or myself. Um, Twitter DM is probably the best way. Um, I tweet at SS Farouk. Matt tweets at nephro underscore spark. Um, thank you again to our Kenna Labs and our outstanding pathologist. And we will thank be doing so this much. again next month. Um, any other questions? Uh, Concluding remarks, Dr. Boyle, if you wanted to share with us before we 
let everyone get back to their Saturday. No, just thank you all for attending and just keeping your minds open to the large spectrum we have here with infection associated coronavirus and just keeping in mind the patient and what fits for them. And just make sure if you get a renal biopsy finding that's pointing towards infection, make sure we're looking clinically um, for something that could have been overlooked or more occult, which is very important for the patient. Yeah, I just wanted to say again, you know, as a nephrologist, it's really, really enlightening for us to kind of watch your, your process and to kind of see you go through live. So we're really excited to continue this going forward. Great, thank you. All right, so we'll leave this session open for a bit to let you all answer the, the polling question. Um, enjoy your weekend and um, keep an eye on Twitter to hear about the next session. Have a good rest of the day, everybody. Thank you.